Humanist Perspective, presented by the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association, following are a few principles of humanism. We're committed to the use of science and reason for understanding the universe and for solving human problems. We're skeptical of untested claims of knowledge, but we're open to new ideas. We are concerned with securing justice and fairness in society and in ending intolerance and discrimination. We are committed to the total separation of religion and government. We affirm humanism as a realistic alternative to the theologies of despair and the ideologies of violence. We reject the concept of an afterlife and believe in living a full and rewarding life here and now. We value and respect each individual's right to judge and lead their lives according to their own position as long as it's respectful of other people living in a free society. We hope you enjoy today's program and others in the weeks to follow. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Humanist Perspective. I'm Jim Dugan, Secretary of NOSHA, the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association. For more information on NOSHA and secular humanism, feel free to look on the web for NOSHA.info. My guest this evening is Candace Huber. Candace is the owner-operator of Tubby and Coos Bookstore on Carrollton Avenue in Mid-City. Uh, Tubby and Coos is a small bookstore in an age of uh, increasing difficulty for bookstores, uh, and you have a very niche identity. Uh, you, you proclaim yourself to be geek heaven or uh, nerd, nerd mecca, I nerd think I mecca, on your yes. web page. And, uh, to, to, so you serve a lot of science fiction, fantasy, um, game playing, but you have a lot going on in your bookstore. You have podcasts, publishing, and school programs, a lot of community involvement. So can you tell us a little bit first how you found yourself with a bookstore? Sure. I have always wanted a bookstore ever since I was a little kid. I actually used to say I wanted to be a librarian, mm -hmm. and then I discovered bookstores were a thing, and so then it became wanting a bookstore. And I always said that if I owned a bookstore, I would want to put it in my grandparents' old neighborhood where they grew up and name it after them. And so that's where Tubby and Koo come from. They're my grandparents, and they grew up just about two blocks from where the bookstore is now. And I just kind of did it. Uh, people ask me how all the time, like, oh, what brought you to owning a bookstore? And I say, well, I just wanted to do it, so I did it. <laughs> There's not really like a huge story there. Um, but my grandparents are, uh, grew up in, in the neighborhood. And at the same time, you're combining that with this nerd identity. Can you yes. tell us a little bit? What does that mean to you and to your your customers? Sure. So to, I'm I'm a nerd in, in a lot of different ways. I'm obviously a book nerd. I own a bookstore. Also, I love board games, which is the store um, sells board games, and we do board game nights and things like that as well. I also really like uh, fandoms, so everything from Star Wars to Doctor Who to Harry Potter, and and basically anything that is considered nerdy or geeky, we try and do. So we do board games, we do graphic novels, we have little like buttons and different things that that are related to these different fandoms because I'm a big believer that fandoms and board games and books bring people together. And as you said, we're really community oriented. Mm -hmm. And so everything surrounds different communities. And so fandoms, people who like different things, uh, that's, that's community as well. So we try and bring people together as much as we can. I've noticed uh, visiting your bookstore that uh, I, one might find information about a lot of different community groups. Uh, sure. I would say that I've had on this program, for example, the priest and priestess of the Beehive Coven. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know who those people were. I met them at an event here uh, that was called Pagan Pride, which I also knew nothing about, <laughs> except that I found a flyer about it 
in your bookstore. Yeah, we try and be a hub for different community groups. Uh, we have things for, for example, Paper Monuments, which is a nonprofit community group that makes posters um, from the people of New Orleans who are wanting to see, asking the people of New Orleans what they want to see in monuments, new monuments that might go mm -hmm. up. And so we have those posters in the store and we partner with them to distribute their information. Uh, we also do work with the Louisiana Books to Prisoners. We do work with a lot of different nonprofit groups, 826 New Orleans and One Book One New Orleans and just any, any group that we can get our hands on, I guess, uh, we will distribute for. We do a lot with the theater community as well and really just anyone who walks in and has something that is unique or different or nerd related or community related, we're more than happy to talk to them and possibly distribute literature for them. So. And what yeah. are programs like One Book One and 826, I think you said? Yeah, yeah. so One Book One New Orleans and 826 New Orleans are two different groups that uh, relate to reading in New Orleans. One Book One New Orleans works with the Literacy Alliance of mm -hmm. New Orleans, and uh, every fall, actually right now, they're, they, get, they try to get the whole city to read the same book at the same time, which is really cool, and they also do a lot of work with adult literacy programming, and so we have worked to create a book with them, and uh, we're they're printing it for them to give out to these adults who have gone through the literacy program and they're just learning how to write. And so that's pretty cool. And then also with 826 New Orleans, that is youth programming to teach kids how to write. Um, and so they also do books. And so we, we try our best to work with those kinds of groups as well. So I, I think I, I, like most people, would probably consider a bookstore typically to be a very quiet place. But it sounds like Yours isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it is not. On any given day, it's probably fairly quiet if you come into the store. Uh, but we definitely do a lot of work. A, a lot of our work's outside of the store as well. Right now, we're doing um, write-ins for National Novel Writing Month. So November is National NaNoWriMo, uh, National Novel Writing Month. That's the abbreviation for it. And so we're doing write-ins every Tuesday night from 6 to 8. You can come and just write in um, mm -hmm. at the store. Uh, for writer communities. We do all kinds of different things to try and, and get people in the store. Uh, board game nights are not so quiet, but <laughs> the write-ins uh, are, are pretty quiet because people are just sitting there writing. So what kind of board games do you have on board game night? So typically we have everything from big group games. We like to start with a big group game that we can play with a bunch of people as people are coming in because you don't want to get into like a one or two hour game when when people are still arriving. And so we usually play some group games to start off and then we break off into smaller groups and do everything from strategy games like Settlers of Catan and Splendor, which is one of my favorite games, to uh, kid, we have kids that come that play kids games. So I would say mostly we focus on those middle of the road strategy games. We don't play like the 12 hour long, <laughs> six hour long, like risk, you know, games. But, uh, but yeah, we tend to stick to the one to two hour strategy games mostly. So in addition to having all kinds of board games and activities and oh, books in the bookstore, mm -hmm. uh, you have a part of your business is publishing. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. It's true. We have actually our first three books are releasing on December 4th, so I'm really excited mm -hmm. about that. We've been working on them for a couple of years now. It has been a process, but I'm really happy about it. And really, I just wanted to support authors that are independent. So our publishing, the way that we do publishing is a hybrid model, although it leans more tr traditional. So that means that the we work with the authors to publish their book so that not everything is on them. When you self-publish, everything is on you to do. Mm -hmm. So we take the work of logistics and the actual printing and the book design and the cover design and all of that on our plate, and then the authors have more time to write, which is really great. And so with this, we accepted submissions, and then we went through the whole process of publishing. We crowdfund at the beginning mm -hmm. so that um, you know we can get it all paid for, and then we uh, 
kind of just go through the process and make the books and it's and it's been a learning process and it's been super fun so so are people submitting whole manuscripts to you that you have to read That's not a lot. yeah <laughs> not anymore when we were accepting submissions at the beginning uh -huh. people we would accept a pitch first mm -hmm. so we would say send us a pitch and then your first three chapters which is typically what we do and then we would read through those and then we would reject the ones we didn't want and then say okay Next step is we like these, send us your whole manuscript, and then we would read from there. So I read who probably about 30 um, manuscripts, which was a lot. Uh, and I'm like, oh man, I can't imagine the, the giant publishers that have gajillions of manuscripts to read, because that is very time consuming. Um, but we, I ended up with three books, two children's books, and um, a young adult mm -hmm. YA novel. Um, What's YA? Young adult. Young adult. Um, okay. Yeah, 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 young adult novel. That is a so this this is this is the young adult novel. Yeah. It is called Captain, and it is a story about Captain Hook's origin. So it's where did where did Captain yeah. Hook come from? So it's a retold fairy tale, and it's going to be a trilogy. So it'll be the whole Peter Pan story, but this first book is is just Captain Hook. And, and prequels are the creative model of the day. Yes, and reboots, right? <laughs> prequels and reboots. Uh, and so this one, I, I really enjoyed the manuscript, and I'm really excited to get this one out. Um, our other two, we have some children's books. This is Alligator Bayou Crawfish, mm -hmm. which is a New Orleans alphabet book, mm -hmm. uh, which is a really, this is the best selling out of the three because it is so New Orleans, and it does start with Alligator Bayou Crawfish, and then we have That's All Y'all at the end. So I, I'm really excited about that one. And then the last one we have is called The Two Stegosauruses, which really fits in with our nerd theme. It is about two stegosauruses, a clumsy one and an awkward one, and they meet and have to sort of overcome their self-doubt mm -hmm. Uh, when they meet each other just, just to have a conversation. So it's about two awkward nerds <laughs> mm -hmm. that meet and become friends. So I'm really excited about all three of these that are to get them out in the world after so long. And, and those are coming out shortly. Yes, so, December, 4th, December 4th, so in just and a couple weeks. The, and you mentioned that in the publishing process, once you've decided that you want to move forward, there's a crowdfunding step in that. Yes. So what, what is that about? What are you... What are you funding with that, or what do you? I don't know enough about the publishing process. I guess. Sure, and so crowdfunding, we put it out there. It's basically selling pre-orders when it comes to ah, books. Okay. So we ask people to pay up front to pre-order the book, uh -huh. and then we use that money for everything that goes into it. So mm -hmm. I paid for the cover design, for example, mm -hmm. um, and also we have to edit, we have to copy edit. The actual printing of the books is mainly what the crowdfunding mm -hmm. paid for, mm -hmm. um, because. You have to pay money up front to get the books printed. And so the mainly it was paying for that, paying for the ISBN numbers, which is something people don't mm -hmm. think about. It's is that expensive? Logistics. Um, it, you have to buy, well, it's better to buy 10 at a time. So mm -hmm. it's it's about 300 ish dollars to buy an ISBN. And so it is it is expensive um, to publish books mm -hmm. and, and to print them. And so that's what we use the crowdfunding money for. So that sounds uh, extremely time consuming and, yes. ex <laughs> and detailed and technical. Yes. Um, and that's not all you do. We talked a little bit about your school programs, um, what, but, um, and you also have podcasts going on. Yes, and so the so with the school programs, we are rolling out some new things too oh. for 2019, so oh, I'm really okay. excited about that. We currently do book fairs that's not the, the traditional book fair model, like it's, it's not like scholastic book fairs. Mm -hmm. What we do is we will go in at the start of the school year and we work with the English department and the teachers to get the list of books students mm -hmm. will need for the whole year, and we allow parents to pre-order order all of the books for the year at the same time and then we deliver the books straight to the classroom and what that does is it prevents parents from having to rush 
during the school year to get books. I see a lot of that at the store. I'll get a call that says, my kid needs this book for tomorrow. Do you have it? Uh -huh. um, and so this this was the, the idea behind this was to prevent that so that you could just have the books, they're in the classroom, and you don't have to worry about them. That's been going really well. Is that, now, are so you far? talking about like textbooks or are you talking about literature books that you? Literature books that they have to read for English class, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, that's been going very well. The parents really like it because mm -hmm. they don't have to scramble at the last minute to find the books. We also do bulk orders for, for classrooms, and so sometimes a whole class has to read the same book, and the school buys it and pays for it, so we'll do bulk ordering for them. And we actually have an educator's night coming up. It'll be our very first one, where it's a networking event for anyone who works with kids. So if you work for a nonprofit, if you're a tutor, if you're a teacher, if you're a school administrator or a librarian, you can come to the educator night It'll be a networking event. We're going to hand out some uh, advanced review copies and different prizes as well and tell everybody about our school programming. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to invite some local authors and nonprofits to talk about what they do. So that should be a really fun event. And that, that's coming up in December as well. You can go to our website to check that out too. So I was just about to ask, how would schools, uh, if they want to participate, how, they just go to your website? Yes. And, and um, if you go to the website, the events section of the website, yeah. you can find um, the educator event and then you can get all the information from there and sign up from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so how are, I, I guess I'm a little confused about what this, schools buy a lot of different kinds of books, right? right? And uh, so there's textbooks uh, and then there's literature and then there's probably more focused literature for different age groups, right? And and how are they choosing what to reach out to you uh, about? So typically, schools will reach either reach out to me or I will reach out to schools that I know mm -hmm. and say, "Here's what we do or what we can do." We also help English teachers come up with recommendation lists to present to administration for kids to read during the school year. We don't deal in textbooks mm -hmm. really at all, but anything thing that we can work with English teachers on. And so English teachers will reach out to us, like I said, for recommendations. Teachers will reach out to us to order in bulk for their classroom whatever book that they need if it's not a textbook. That happens a lot. And mostly we work with school librarians mm -hmm. because we will donate books to libraries that can't afford to buy them. Especially we get a lot of advanced review copies that we can't sell per the publishers. And so we work with school librarians to give those out to them and really just listen to what their needs are. Different different schools have different needs. Like you said, different classrooms have different needs. And so we work with teachers and school librarians to sort of customize whatever it is that they need for their classroom when it comes to books and learning and even connecting with tutors and things like that as well. I suspect that um having an opportunity for educators to meet with each other and discuss these materials is very important. I find, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm teaching in a very different environment at a university, but that um, some books, it's a lot easier to get students to talk about, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's very important in, in the education process. Yes. And so one of the values is providing a forum for the users of these books to get together and say, hey, that's what worked about this one, or and that's that was, uh, which works better in the classroom for different purposes. That's right, and also connecting to local authors as well, mm -hmm. because a lot of classrooms really like author visits, teachers and mm -hmm. schools like visits from authors, and so being able to connect local schools with authors that are willing to come and do presentations and talk about their books as well. Um, among so many things that you have going on, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about your podcasts yes. as well. Yes, so we have a podcast that is called Winterfell and I Can't Get Up, which <laughs> is sort of a joke name. It is a Game of Thrones podcast and I do that with my mom. So the story behind this podcast is that my mom is not at all a nerd. She doesn't know a whole lot about nerd stuff. And so she really wanted to find, find something to connect with me on from a nerd perspective. And so she said, how about I read Game of Thrones? And I was like, mom, that's a big commitment. There are a lot of books. They're very large books. I don't know. 
And so she said, well, I'll just read the first one, and if I don't like it, I'll quit. So I said, okay. So then I told her I would read it with her so that we could discuss and, and kind of have our own little book club. And then I talked to her, because Game of Thrones is such a, there's a lot of things that happen, and there are a lot of twists and turns. And I told my mom, I think it would be really fun to just get her reactions to it on a podcast when things happen. And so that's what it is. It's a Game of Thrones podcast where I discuss Game of Thrones books with my mom as we're reading. We're about halfway through the first book mm -hmm. right now. And it's been really fun. I get to go over to my mom's once a week and we talk about Game of Thrones, which is really cool. And she's never read it. She's never seen the TV show. She doesn't know anything about it. And I've read all the books and seen every episode of the show. So it's really interesting for me to watch her journey. And I thought it would be fun for other people too as well. And it is. My mom is also really funny. So the podcast. <laughs> that helps a lot. Yes, it definitely helps. <laughs> I can imagine myself in that situation. Like, you know, what, but what did the, why did they do this? And you would know, you would have all the answers. Right? Yes. You know, the, the material inside and out. And, and it is hard for me sometimes to not react whenever she reacts to things and because I don't want to give her spoilers and so I know what's happening and she doesn't and so when she she reacts or says something it's it's hard for me not to go like no that's not what it is or you know to to tell her what's going to happen so I I try and keep it all in as much as I can <laughs> So do people listen to the podcast just on the your uh, website do you have it on YouTube uh, we have RSS it. speed, if you know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> we have it on um, the Google Podcasts, mm -hmm. um, on Apple Podcasts, mm -hmm. on the website, and on Stitcher, um, which are which is another podcast listening thing. Mm -hmm. So those are the places where you can get. Most people use either Apple or Google mm -hmm. anyway. So uh, so yeah. So those are all the places that you can get it. Uh, and any idea what your audience is like? That's the hard part. I have no idea. For podcasts, <laughs> it's really hard. It's like they sometimes will give you analytics on how many listeners you're getting, but you don't really know who they are or anything about them. So I have no idea. My mom and I are kind of just doing it for fun. So we'll, we're just going to keep doing it. And if five people want to listen to it, that's great. If we get 100 people, that's great, too. So do you just use a little video recorder? Or, or I mean, you can get pretty elaborate with decent microphones you and can. production equipment. Yeah, we do don't podcast. use, we don't do video. Mm -hmm. um, we do audio. And so I just bought a microphone. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a stand-up microphone. I, I bought a Yeti and <laughs> we it, it hooks to my computer via USB. Mm -hmm. So it's using a Yeti microphone and my laptop um, and we just use that to record. And then there's a free software called Audacity mm -hmm. and that is what I use mm -hmm. to uh, do the to produce the mm -hmm. audio mm -hmm. uh, and then put it on the website. Mm -hmm. And then it's an RSS feed that goes to all of the different mm -hmm. sites. Mm -hmm that carry the podcast. So it, it wasn't that expensive to do. I mean, I think podcasts are pretty easy mm -hmm. to set up and, and do anybody. I mean, you could really do it with your phone if you really wanted to. If the audio the most, wouldn't be great, but. <laughs> I think the, the most demanding part of uh, po podcasting is probably getting a decent microphone. I find that yes. makes the biggest difference in sound quality. Absolutely, you know, is, absolutely. And then the, the producing, if you're gonna really do it right, the producing of it is mm -hmm. very time consuming. So just editing the the, the audio, editing the audio, blocking, and getting rid of some stuff you don't want, and exactly. tightening it up a little bit. Yes. Uh, yep. So I, uh, how you're doing all of this, uh, I, I don't really know. Um, <laughs> a question uh, that comes to mind: if you're encouraging, you're starting to do publishing, and yep. authors might uh, bring submissions to you. So, what advice would you have for? prospective writers here in New Orleans? So my biggest advice is to know who you are submitting to. Mm -hmm. I think that that is one thing that I've seen a lot with authors, either already self-published authors that are coming to get their book in the store or people who were submitting for us to publish them. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing is, is know your audience. I get a lot of people, you know, we're very niche as we've been talking about and so we're pretty much all science fiction and fantasy and then some children's books and so 
there are people who come in all the time with things that don't fit into that. And we got a lot of submissions that we just were immediately able to say no to because it didn't fit into that niche. So I think the best piece of advice that I can give is to do your research on who you are pitching to before you do that and, and know the niche and, and know your audience and kind of cater your pitch to that and tell them why you think you're book fits in with specifically what they do. And proofread. Proofread, yes. Oh. Editing <laughs> is the biggest thing ever. I if you're gonna if you're gonna self publish for sure, editing, edit, edit, edit. I edit. think that's one of the biggest things for sure, yeah. Another aspect of your business is uh, that uh, you uh, want to, to guide things in a socially conscious direction. What do you mean by that? How does that apply? So by socially conscious, I mean that the, first of all, the environmental footprint that the business leaves. So things like recycling, things like using local vendors for things instead of using big national vendors, trying to do as much as I can to support the immediate community that's around me, working with the local nonprofits, trying to make connections and really focus more on the immediate community and what my business can do to help the immediate community, whether that's buying our bags locally or whether that is offering space to nonprofits who need somewhere to meet or distributing posters. So anything that we can do to help the community and really be more conscious of what's going on in the community and doing what we can to support that. So I have to ask at this point, how many hours a day do you work? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Uh, it is just me. I mean, me, myself, and I operation doing all this stuff. So I, I definitely work seven days a week. And most of the time, it's 12 to 14 hours a day. So mm -hmm. it's a lot. But I tell you know, it seems like a lot, but it doesn't feel like work to me. Mm -hmm. I really love what I do. And for example, work right now I'm working or whenever mm -hmm. I went to, uh, I did a conference this past weekend where we sold books and I just sat there and talked to poets and authors for four days. Mm -hmm. That's work and so I, I really enjoy it. So it sounds like it's a lot of hours and it is, but it's when you're just mm -hmm. hanging out and talking about books all the time, it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And, and you enjoy working in the schools too? The, the, how many hours? Well, that's probably not every day, but. Yeah, in that's a week, not in a every month. day. Yeah, that's not every day. And I don't actually go into the schools. Mm -hmm. I more meet with teachers and librarians okay. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And most of that takes place at the bookstore. So I very much enjoy my connections with them, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't really get to go into the schools that much. That's, that's, that's very rare. Uh, which it, I think that would be cool to go into schools a little bit more too. But let's not take on another project. Yeah. Quite, quite You're yet. right. I don't need another project. <laughs> so, um, what did, do you have any advice for uh, other people who might want to be in the bookstore business? So my advice would be know what you're getting into. It's a lot of work. Uh, as I said, it's a, it's a lot of hours. So make sure, and I think this is good for any business, that you really, really love it and that you really, really want to do it and you're willing to spend all of your time doing it. I love curating the selection of books. Uh, so my best advice would be know what you're getting into, know that you love it, and really just do it. A lot of people are just afraid to take that jump. So I encourage you to do it. If you, if you know your niche and you know your market, go ahead and do it. We have very little time left. Was it hard for you to make that jump yourself? It, or it just was natural? It was natural for me. It, it was not very hard to make that jump. It's been hard to make some other jumps, but that initial, I'm gonna open the bookstore, I just kind of knew that it was time. So I just went ahead and did it and it wasn't that hard. Candace Huber, thank you so very much for thank being with you. us this evening. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. <laughs>